Hello, I'm Jim Turk, the director of the Center for Free Expression at Toronto Metropolitan University, and I would like to welcome you to today's event. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for today's panel, which are the Canadian Association of Journalists, the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and Penn Canada. In 2022, Massey College at the University of Toronto entered into a partnership with the Literary Review of Canada to establish an annual essay on the state of the media, which was to be a forum for substantive media criticism. The inaugural Massey essay was written by Haroon Siddiqui and published by the Literary Review of Canada. In it, Haroon argues that, and I'm quoting, are of are a sensibly free media has played a leading role in the cultural warfare waged on Muslims, chiefly against those who are fellow citizens in the West, and most ironically, against Muslim women. He added, even such icons of liberalism as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Toronto Star, along with leading British, French, German, Indian, and Australian dailies, have been guilty to varying degrees. Today, we have a remarkable panel of journalists, or I, say, I should say, we have a panel of remarkable journalists who will critically discuss the role of Western media in relation to Islamophobia, especially since 9-11. I'd like to introduce them, beginning with the author of the Massey essay, Haroon Siddiqui. Haroon is a former longtime uh, columnist, news editor, um, and is now editorial page editor emeritus of the Toronto Star. He's a former president of Penn Canada and recipient of many awards, the Order of Canada, the Order of Ontario. He received an honorary doctorate from the, uh, York University, is a winner of the National Press Club's UNESCO Award and numerous na national newspaper awards. Welcome, Haroon. Thank you, Jim, for organizing this uh, get together of uh, very distinguished fellow journalists, and I'm glad to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. Our, our second panelist is Tony Berman. Tony is former head of Al Jazeera English and of CBC News, and was a visiting professor at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University School of Journalism between 2011 and 2016. While managing director of Al Jazeera's English News Channel in Qatar from 2008 to 2010, its worldwide reach more than doubled to two, uh, 220 million households. He led the campaign that brought Al Jazeera to Canada in 2009 and expanded it throughout the United States. While at the CBC, he spent more than three decades as an award-winning news and documentary producer working in 30 countries and spent seven years as CBC's editor-in-chief. He is now a freelance uh, contributing columnist to the Toronto Star. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. Our third panelist is Michelle Shepard. Michelle is an award-winning journalist, author, filmmaker, and podcast host, and producer. She's covered issues of terrorism and civil rights since the 9-11 attacks. During her two decades at the Toronto Star, she reported from more than 20 countries, including Somalia, Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan, and went behind the wire at the U.S. Naval Prison in Guantanamo Bay more than two dozen times. She was a co-director and producer of the Emmy Award-dominated documentary Guantanamo's Child, which won uh, the Canada Screen Awards for Best Direction and the Donald Britton Award for the Best Social and Political Program. She has produced, directed, and written numerous other award-winning uh, films and documentaries, and is a three-time recipient of the National Newspaper Award, 
the Governor General Missioner's Award for uh, Public Service Journalism, and the author of numerous books, including Guantanamo's Child, The Untold Story of Omar Khadr, and Decade of Fear, Reporting from Terrorism's Gray Zone. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, our final panelist is Omar Sachedina. Omar is the chief news anchor and senior editor of C CTV National News. He previously has been a journalist at CTV National News in Toronto, Ottawa, and then national affairs correspondent. He has covered many international stories, including multiple assignments in Ukraine during the war, reporting from the Colombia-Venezuela border, on, Venezuela, on Venezuela's power struggle between uh, Nicolas Maduro and Juan Guaido, and the pro-democracy protest in Hong Kong, as well as the November uh, 2017 church massacre in Texas, the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, the Boston Marathon bombings, and the mass murder of 77 people at a youth camp in Norway. He's received no multiple nominations uh, for awards, uh, including the best uh, national news reporter at, at the Canadian Screen Awards, as well as many other awards. We're honored to have you with us today, Omar. Welcome. And then our, our moderator for this uh, panel is Julian Scher. Julian is senior producer of, uh, was senior producer of CBC's Fifth Estate, he, he's an investigative journalist. He served as an investigative journalist with the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. He's the author of six widely acclaimed books and has a seventh that's coming out uh, next month. He's filmed, written, and produced major documentaries across the globe and covered scandals, wars, and corporate intrigue. He's the winner and three-time nominee for a Gemini, Gemini uh, Canada's equivalent of the Emmys for TV. He's a recipient of the Governor General's Award for Meritorious Public Service for Uncovering Miscarriages of Justice. He's trained journalists around the world, including in Bangladesh, Syria, Turkey, Kosovo. And last year, his documentary, Ghosts of, Af of, of Afghanistan, won the top award for the best documentary, the Canadian Screen Awards, Canada's equivalent of the Emmys and the Oscars, along with winning the award for best editing and best writing. Welcome, Julian. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, we've got a great panel. I'm going to try to stay in the background as much as possible and let these panelists um, uh, thrill you with their insight. Uh, please uh, uh, send what, in your questions. Yeah, I, let me just explain, Julian. So for the audience, um, in this version of, of uh, Zoom that we're using, you will be able to ask questions of the panel. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. Uh, that's what you use to ask questions. The chat button is not functional. So at any point during their conversation, um, you can a question comes to mind that you'd like to ask one or more members of the panel, just click on the Q&A button, uh, write down your question while you're thinking of it. And then after 45, 50 minutes or so of conversation amongst the panel, Julian will turn to the audience and he will ask Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, to read out the first question. And she'll present the questions in turn to the, uh, the panel. So take it, please take advantage of this opportunity when we have such a distinguished panel to ask questions that come to mind uh, simply by clicking on the Q&A button and writing them out. That's all for me. So over to, over to the panel. All right, let's take it away. Um, and let's keep this as a conversation so that the five of you can um can discuss and debate uh, amongst yourself. Haroon, it's it's obvious, I think, to start with you. Um, you know, you've been writing and a lot of us have been reading you in the Toronto Star for years, but what prompted you to write this uh, this quite moving cri du cas and the literary review about what you called, and I'm quoting you, a, unique a uniquely shameful chapter in modern history. Could you describe briefly what was your central message and what prompted you to speak out? Thank you, Julian. I wrote it because somebody asked me to write it. Mm -hmm. um, the Massey College, in its wisdom, has now uh, instituted an annual essay on the status of the media, which is, in America, there's a great tradition of media criticism and so on. In Canada, we have lacked it. And Massey College now has filled that vacuum. And uh, she asked me to write. She gave me uh, no instructions of what topic to choose, but I'd been thinking about this issue for a long time. 
as a continuation of my lifelong um, criticism of the media, fellow journalists, while being part of them, uh, as to how they have treated minorities in this country. Historically, we have not been, our record has not been very good um, with anyone, uh, right from the right from the original times right up to the modern era. Uh, I think what's more important to answer your question is to what did not prompt me to write it, uh, which is that I'm not an activist. Um, I'm not a representative of Muslims. Nobody appointed me to anything. Um, I wrote it as a journalist, as I said, who is critical of the media. Um, I wrote it as a journalist who is also familiar with the shortcomings and the glories of the media. Uh, and I've always, for uh, in a lifelong uh, speeches across the country to various minorities, I've always said, uh, just remember that media are not in the business of doing public relations for you or for any group. Uh, we are adversarial. Uh, we are rambunctious. We are overly negative. Um, and uh, we often fall uh, towards uh, being finding the lowest common denominator. On our good days, we might find our highest common factor. But these are the sort of uh, weaknesses of the media. Those very methodologies of the media let us also see and understand um, that we are not an equal opportunity offender. Uh, that is the most important point in all of this discussion. Whereas we fancy ourselves as the champion of the underdog, uh, we are deferential to the rich and the powerful, and we are careless and cavalier with the poor uh, and with the marginalized people. And that brought us to 9-11, uh, and when Muslim bashing became a popular pastime with politicians and everybody else, media gladly joined in and kick the Muslims down the media caste system to the lowest level. I think that's what prompted me to write, and that was my thinking when I wrote it. Well, let's pick up on, on what you said. You talked about Muslim bashing, and um, uh, Michelle, Tony, and Omar, um, uh, you know, Haroon also talks about how he feels the media's green scare, the scare about Muslims, was arguably worse than the Red Scare of the 1950s. 9-11 um, was obviously a turning point in media coverage. So let me ask all of you, to what extent do you think we're, we're still living in the shadow of that lens? Tony, um, looking back, and we'll get later into some of your more recent experiences, but looking back, um, what errors of either ignorance or stereotyping uh, do you think existed in the Canadian media and mus about Muslims just before 9-11 and immediately after? I mean, looking back, uh, it's 22 years ago, I think that uh, clearly there, there were mistakes made. I think at that time, I would guess they were more out of ignorance than any conscious um, uh, racial bias. I think, um, I mean, Haroon's, essay is both provocative and important. It makes a lot of excellent points that need to be made. But his uh, a central point that he makes that I would take some exception to is that on the, uh, he, he basically uh, charges or accuses or argues that the media paints too negative a brush, has painted too negative a brush of Muslims. Um, and I think there are many examples, certainly American examples of that being the case. But I think in the same way, I think that his essay paints too negative a brush of the media's treatment of, of Muslims, but certainly as it applies to Canada. I mean, I, I don't think, although it's 21 years ago, um, 22 years ago, I, I think we should remember that, that around 9-11, 2001, I think certainly I would argue the CBC as well as other major news organizations were incredibly careful and restrained about associating the 19 or 20 uh, bombers in the US with uh, a religion of, of billions. You know, I, And I think that I, as somebody who was central to the CBC's coverage, I remember then countless meetings where that we, we stressed that, 
it was echoed up and down. And I think that if one did a careful analysis, not only the CBC's coverage, but also I think some of the major news organizations at the time, that, that did we make mistakes? Yes, we made mistakes, but I, I don't think they are as negative as, as in some ways than the essay portrays. I mean, I, I think um, we look at anti-Muslim uh, bias now in the media from a prism of 2023. And I think I certainly acknowledge that Trump and his far right crowd has emboldened a lot of people, has in a sense made legitimate, quote unquote, certainly in the US uh, to a certain extent, some of that has spread to Canada. But I, I don't think, and it's really made anti-Muslim bias a political weapon, it's weaponized that. But I think if you go back, I think that that uh, to 2001, I think that there was far more of an openness then on the part of the media to uh, take a fair and restrained approach. And I think uh, I think a lot of us, a lot of non-Muslim journalists in Canada at the time, and I certainly include myself, found 9-11 as the beginning of a, of a long um, uh, educational process about the, the growing diversity of our society. So my only caution about the essay is that um, we can't, the Muslims are not monolithic, the media are not monolithic. And I think to fall into either trap, I think can be very misleading in terms of trying to figure out remedies. Well, let's get, we'll get into that uh, in, in a bit about, um, you know, how guilty are we in Canada? And is there a difference between Canada and, and the U.S. Picking up on what you said, Tony, Michelle, you, you covered 9-11 in New York, and that was the start of your national security beat. And one of your books is called Decade of Fear. Um, when you're especially known for covering the Omar Cotter case, to what degree has, because you've been covering this for 20 years, based <laughs> on what Tony was saying, have you seen a change in how we are covering um, uh, Muslims in the Canadian media. Yeah, I think we, I think we have, and I think I agree both with Haroon and and with Tony in varying degrees. Um, you know, the idea of writing the book "Decade of Fear" or, or that title, um, which came out in 2011, I probably could do a second edition, um, <laughs> but uh, the next decade. But it was because so much of what our policies post 9-11 were driven by, they were driven by fear. And I think, I think that did reflect in some ways in the media in that, you know, we didn't question policies, we didn't question stories uh, in, in ways that we do now, hopefully. Um, but having covered 9-11, I mean, I can vividly recall what it was like to be there still. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes maybe some of the younger people watching this wouldn't, wouldn't know this or, you know, definitely not remember it. But, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a really scary time for a few months later. We had the anthrax square, we had this, we had that. Every story that came out was a potential of, you know, the next, the next attack. So that definitely drove a lot of the coverage at the beginning. And I think if I looked back to some of that now, some of it would be quite cringe worthy in terms of how sensational it was, but it was such a, it was such a personal attack for North American audience. But I think you mentioned the Omar Cotter case. And I think that's a really good example of how um, our coverage has changed over the years, but also to Haroon's point of this, what did become an anti-Muslim bias. And, and, I, and I agree with Tony in that it's not quite as dire as what we see in the States and certainly not what we've seen recently um, or, in, or in times right after 9-11. But I think in some ways in Canada, it was a little bit more insidious. It would be, I know when I started my beat, um, I had great difficulty getting any security sources you know, to do those kind of sides of the story. So I started going hard after the Meher Rar case, the Omar Khadr case, Nuruddin, Al Malki, Al Mahdi, some of these names people might remember. And these were cases of, of Muslim men who had their civil rights violated. And really, there wasn't a lot of, at that time, stories being done questioning that uh, in other times in history where Canadians would be, of course. Um, so that, but even though at the star, there was support to do those stories, and definitely the Omar Khadr story when we started. I'll tell you, it was back of the newspaper kind of coverage. <laughs> so I wasn't, I was still allowed to do it, but you know, I would have, we still talked about stories in inches back then, you know, I would have 10 inches to do a story, which is not a very long 
piece for very nuanced stories. And it would be on A24 if I was lucky. Um, you know, over the years, as time went on, the Omar Cotter story became yeah. bigger, bigger and bigger and crept further to the front. And I think the reason that I enjoyed that story for so many, so many years, um, you know, and, and did a lot on it was because for me, it was very emblematic of so many things that changed after 9-11 and that, you know, anti-Muslim bias was one of them. Omar, you're, you're lucky to be one of the youngest of the bunch here. <laughs> and and if, if I'm not mistaken, I think you were still in university when 9-11 when happened. So I wanted to ask you, as a young Muslim watching and consuming the news back then, um, how did you feel about the coverage in the aftermath of 9-11? And then in the years immediately afterwards where um, you land up covering some of it? Yeah, you know, it was, it was a fascinating time for me to be a student of political science at McGill University because right after 9-11 um, is where, you know, we read Samuel Huntington's uh, Clash of Civilizations. And then we spent a lot of time picking it apart. And we had concluded that it was, um, you know, a very simplistic piece of writing. And there was a lot of discussion and debate that was generated. And as I was consuming media, because of course, back then as a student, I was consuming it and now I'm, <laughs> I'm in it. Um, I, I was finding that there were certain uh, frames that that a lot of journalists were falling into, right? And I and I I don't want to say that it was um, intentional. I would like to believe that it was not intentional, but I but I think you know I often wonder, I often wonder whether secular societies are are fully at ease when it comes to reporting on stories of religion. There has often been a somewhat tenuous relationship with um, reporting on, on religions, and I'm talking about Christianity as well. And here you have this huge and massive and, and, and fairly seminal discussion on, on Islam and its implications. And so I think that added um, another dimension to the discussion, which, which you know, frankly made it very challenging for journalists. Um, and I think what was happening when a lot of the reporting was going on is again there were there were these simplistic frames that that you know a lot of journalists or a lot of reporting uh, was falling into and, and a lot of that you know Harun has quite uh, eloquently uh, explicated in his in his Massey essay uh, egregious and glaring examples right down to who was being um, put out as representatives or ambassadors of the Muslim community so you know if you didn't have a Muslim who had a beard or a woman who had a hijab, um, you know, that the emphasis was on having those voices because it gave a certain street cred to the to the report, right? Those people were manifestly Muslim. And so it gave them a little bit more authority to speak on behalf of, you know, what by some accounts is the fastest growing religion in the world. I think what has happened since then, uh, Julian, you had, uh, you know, you're, the way you put that question to Michelle, I thought was brilliant. You said, you know, what what has um, has it changed? Has coverage of uh, Islam and Muslims changed in the 21 years since 9-11? And I would say it has changed because there are more Muslims covering uh, Islam. And I think that that has completely changed the calculus. And by the same token, I think that there are non-Muslims who have an openness to accept that this is as, as Tony put, it's not a monolithic religion. People practice this faith mm -hmm. in very different ways, just as a Christian from Nigeria would you know, practice the faith somewhat differently than a Christian from, from Canada. Uh, and so realizing that nuance has certainly made, I think the, uh, the reporting uh, better, it has made it uh, stronger. The fact that you do have more Muslims in the media who are, you know, also cognizant of that and, and able to sort of highlight those uh, aspects of the faith has also made it better. So, um, you know, of course, in the, in the past 20 years, there have been uh, examples where the reporting hasn't been where it ought to have been. But, but I do feel optimistic that things are changing. There's obviously a lot more that, that we need to do. Uh, we need more representations of, of Islam and Muslim uh, that, that show to people that it isn't you know, practiced in one or a singular uh, way. And I think we're getting there. Well, I think you've all staked out, you know, uh, somewhat different and, and strong positions. Um, so let's move on to, to one of the, 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 the central issues. One thing that I found, Haroon, striking in, in, your, in your article um, and in your position is that 
you, you don't just blame the usual suspects, Fox News, the, you know, the right wing media, um, which I think most of us would agree, um, who are fanning the flames, but you take particular um, attention to target the liberal media, uh, including the New York Times. Um, can you talk, if you can, about one study you cite about the New York Times coverage um, or address, you know, what Tony and others have said that Canada's more liberal media was better than the Americans? Uh, thank you. No, in fact, um, that's a very good question. Let me just go back, uh, if you let me do so, uh, to Tony's point. Um, it's always, the danger is that you always uh, paint a broad brush. Uh, it's quite obvious that not everyone is equally guilty, as I say that in that essay. Yeah, uh, it is the general framework that I talk about. And in obviously Canadian newspapers, Canadian media generally were far better than the American ones, that's one. Um, but number two, yet at the same time, it is clear that the, the sins committed by most Canadian media, perhaps with the honorable exception of the CBC and the Toronto Star, not because it was my paper, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we are all equally guilty, roughly speaking, broadly speaking, as an industry. Collective guilt on Muslims, any terrorist act anywhere. What do you, Siddiqui, have to say about this? I am personally responsible for what happened in Beslan or someplace like that. Um, I did not take the bait. I could afford not to take the bait, but ordinary Muslims were not in a position to date, uh, take the bait because there was relentless pressure put on them that they ought to somehow take responsibility for the actions of 19 people. This is racism. This is Islamophobia. This is nonsense. This is not journalistic standards, you know? That's one. Uh, the second thing that happened is as soon as the war began, the war on terror began, everyone was giving us, most people were giving us more jingoism than journalism, including the so-called liberal media. Uh, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, and every newspaper that we know of were cheerleading George W. Bush and everyone else. And I can list, run through a list of sins that followed from there, including the liberal media. And the New York Times and Washington Post were the leading exponents of the need for the war on uh, Iraq or the non-existent weapons of mass destruction, you know? So uh, when I speak in those general terms, I'm speaking about collectively, it's a shameful chapter in our history. I say that out of sadness, um, and I say this because it's my own profession. I feel it more strongly. And to Omar's point that uh, the coverage has improved, obviously has come, improved, people learn. If, if we had not learned something in 20 years, uh, we ought to be even more ashamed than we should be. But I don't agree with you, Omar, completely on the point that there are more Muslims reporting and so on. I don't. Anytime you have more people with different backgrounds, more diversity, you get a different point of view, goes without saying. But we ought not to have uh, 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 black people to cover black Canadians. It's not necessary. I don't believe in the appropriations debate. I mean, that's a different issue altogether. All journalists ought to be um, following a certain standard and ought to be able to cover things in a way that is professional, that is fair, that is broadly speaking uh, equal to all communities. Uh, we ought not to, uh, if you were to wait for Muslims to come into the media to, to improve coverage, we'll be waiting a long time. You know, if you wanted to have uh, Chinese Canadians come into the media to improve coverage of Chinese Canadians in Canada, we'll be waiting a long time. It, we ought not to give that license to the media that you are somehow excused for now. Diversity is a good thing, we ought to have it, goes without saying, but that does not excuse us for the sins that we have committed. That's the point I'm making. Leave it, and if the three of you want, want to respond, even if we're better than, uh, and it's a pretty low bar, um, than some of the worst of, of American media. Um, Michelle talked about our coverage being sometimes a little more insidious in Omar's, in um, Haroon's uh, uh, article, he talks about cartoons that appeared in the Globe, in the Montreal Gazette, um, which by any standards uh, would not be accepted if they were directed against other groups. So um, I'd like yeah. any of the three of you to-, yeah. to can, I, can I make a comment? Um, yeah, the, the um, I think this is 
more um, uh, subtle than simply Canadian journalists saying we're better than American journalists. I think there's something much wider in play here. I think if one did a careful um, uh, outline of the coverage from 2001, from 9-11, right through the Afghan war, that I guess my argument would be that that did the Canadian media in general, and I probably would include the CBC, kind of fall into line uh, during the 10 years, for example, of Stephen Harper's uh, um, uh, tenure, did, did, did the Canadian media fall into line in being cheerleaders for the Canadian military in Afghanistan, or contrary to Canada's view, Canada's approach in 2003, they eventually became part of this Western alliance that would uh, cleanse Afghanistan and the rest of the of the you know the Middle East or the the Muslim world. I mean, I, I think that clearly there was. I mean, the, the, I think the media and in Canada's media is is as vulnerable. Tends to love the side they perceive as winning, and they 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 ah. we do have collectively have a a tendency to roll over if the stated policy line is going in this direction. So I think in that sense, was there. Uh, a, a change in our approach, uh, Canada's approach, the answer is yes. But I guess my point, it, it wasn't rooted in anti-Muslim racism. I think it was political. It, a lot of it was political. We're dealing with power. You know, uh, the fact that Muslims in particular would feel vulnerable in, in this, in the invasion of Iraq is obvious. But, you know, but I don't think the Americans went into Iraq. I mean, they're an imperial power. They, they, they are equal opportunity, uh, uh, you know, uh, ba uh, battlers, you know. So I, I guess my point is that, and I, I, even in the Afghan war, where I think some Canadian journalists fell into line in this cheerleading of Canadian troops, I still think, uh, and I, do, I saw this from afar as well as within Canada, that, that Canadian news organizations and Canadian journalists still tried to distinguish the, the Muslim aspect from the political aspect. So I, are I think you in saying, that sense, are you saying, Tony, that say Al Jazeera's coverage of the war on terror was about the same as the coverage uh, given in the West, or vice versa? Was the coverage that we provided, even in Canada, uh, of the same quality, of the same depth, same nuance as that of Al Jazeera? Obviously not. No, 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 no. I, I definitely don't, and I, I because I think what happened in in the Western media in this way, I would include much of the Canadian media, that they fell into line in terms of a kind right. of a, a political take. What I'm saying, that was not, I would argue, that was not rooted in anti-Muslim racism. That was rooted in a, in this kind of collective uh, uh, insanity that took over a lot of governments, including the Harper government, that this was what the West should do. Omar, you, you're, you're now sitting in the anchor chair and we're still covering the war in Afghanistan <laughs> and its aftermath and 9-11. And um, um, do, do, you, do you see a difference in coverage now um, than you did um, uh, when you were watching it 20 years ago? Well, I think now, you know, we are, uh, I would say, probably far more critical of what we were able to accomplish mm -hmm. in that time, right. right? And I think that certainly this is not just true of Afghanistan, but when you look at um, all war coverage in, in the past several decades, um, there has been, uh, you know, a considerable amount of um, work that has been done on, um, you know, how jingoistic reporting has been, how jingoistic journalism has been, and I think certainly after after the pullout, uh, it, it has, um, you know, it, it has put more scrutiny on, you know, why why were we there in the first place, and what are the long term implications? Uh, you know, I, I would. I think one of the questions will be, uh, you know, I think one of the stories that we've been missing um, on, a, on a broad scale is that, you know, now that you have this government in place, the Taliban, uh, you know, I've, I've been speaking with NGOs over the past uh, few months. This is, this, is, this is a government for better or for worse that NGOs will have to deal with. How are they doing that, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it's certainly been a push that we would like to make uh, in terms of highlighting that just from a, from a curiosity sake. But I think if we were to distill, you know, your question quite simply, my answer would be, you know, there, there has been uh, more scrutiny. We have become more critical. 
I wish we had been more critical um, d- during the war as well. I think it's an obligation, as as Harun said off the top, um, that that we all have. I don't think we're excessively negative. <laughs> I think that we are appropriately cynical, which is what our jobs are. Um, but but I think, um, and again, I don't I don't want to overgeneralize, but but I do think that uh, we have certainly become more. Uh, critical about what exactly we we accomplished and what the long-term impact will be. If I can just add to that, uh, Julian, I don't want to take us too far off our topic, which is, you know, this idea of the demonization of, of Muslims in the media. But one important note, I think, for Afghanistan, too, is that, you know, we had a stake in it. So a lot of the journalists, we had mm-hmm. Canadian troops there. So a lot of the journalists who reported from there um, were embedded. And I I was actually always kind of thankful that I had colleagues that were doing that and I didn't have to do that because I think it's really, really difficult to report fairly and accurately and as unbiased as possible when you're embedded with the people who are keeping you safe. And so I think over the years, we romanticized that war in a way because because those were there with these Canadian troops. And I think, you know, a really interesting study would be, I don't know if it's been done, but looking at the Canadian coverage of the Iraq war versus the um, war in Afghanistan, because we didn't have troops there, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a stake. And um, it was difficult for, and you know this, Julian, you, you covered a lot of the war and you've done, you know, your documentary on it. Um, you know, it was difficult for the journalists in the early days who were reporting critically on the war. I mean, the backlash that they got um, was intense. And as Omar says, obviously, we needed to do it a lot more than we did if you if you looked back. And now it's thankfully being done. And just one other point to what Omar was saying earlier about the diversity in, in newsrooms. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Omar was saying Haroon necessarily that having a more diverse newsroom and having Muslim reporters reporting on Muslim issues, that not suggesting that that's what they should have to report on, but that just by diversity alone, which is still quite terrible, um, but getting better, it does add to generally better news coverage because your colleagues call you out on things that out of ignorance, perhaps you wouldn't know. And then that for me is a little bit of optimistic, not just having, makes me optimistic, not just having a more diverse newsroom. But also, I think we talk a lot more these days in journalism about the lenses we bring to our reporting. And that's sort of thanks to, you know, this reckoning that we've had with Indigenous um, communities and how we've covered Indigenous communities. But that idea that, you know, I don't think, I don't hear any, when I talk to journalism schools um, now, I mean, we don't talk about objective journalism anymore. You know, we talked about, talk about fair journalism, but of course, everybody brings a lens. Of course, everybody brings their own background and biases. And just knowing that and knowing that that can affect your coverage, I think is really important. And people are acknowledging that more now. And and Michelle, you, that, that, you, you right. bring more, more knowledge, more intelligence to the debate and discussion as to how you go about doing so. And the very fact, and this thing is, is a less understood fact about modern Canada. Canada is so wonderfully, extraordinarily diverse now, blessed with people from all over the world who are infinitely more informed than the average Canadian used to be for a long time. Canada is no longer parochial as it used to be. Our media was parochial. Um, anytime we went abroad in the old days, it was Orientalist kind of journalism. Uh, those those savage Africans, those ignorant uh, cow worshipping Indians and so on and so forth. We have become more sophisticated. Society is far more informed, far more cosmopolitan, far more knowledgeable about the world. And we have people from every part of the world. And unfortunately, the media uh, have not caught up to Canadians up uh, on this international cosmopolitanism. I tell a story, I mean, uh, and this is not to reveal any confidences, when Mr. Krechian, the prime minister, was going, uh, I got a call Saturday on a Saturday at home. The prime minister wants to speak to you. So what do you say as a journalist? Yes, sir. You know, <laughs> and he said, I'm going to see Mr. Bush on Monday. Uh, I have to talk to him about uh, the Iraq war. Uh, what do you think I should tell him? So I said, far be from me, prime minister, to tell you what to tell the president of the United States. All I'm hearing is that many Canadians are viscerally opposed to this war. And you know what was his response? He said, that's what I hear, especially from new Canadians. Hmm. I mean, this man's antenna was up. He knew that 
uh, there's a new Canada at work here that they know they don't like American imperialism. They don't like American warmongering. Uh, and whereas much of the Canadian media, certainly the right-wing group of newspapers, which are heavily concentrated uh, first on Conrad Black, then Izzy Asper, now post media group, including the Sun group of newspapers in every major city in, in the country. It was rah, rah, rah for the war in Afghanistan. It was rah, rah, rah for the war in Iraq. Whereas majority, an overwhelming majority of Canadians were opposed to that war. So there is a disconnect between the Canadian people and most of the Canadian media. We have a problem here. If just more prime ministers called you, Haroon, you know, we would try. <laughs> no, uh, we don't want prime ministers calling us, but if they call you, you have to answer it. <laughs> one of one of the, the big justifications for Canada's role in Afghanistan, uh, not so much at the beginning, but certainly after and up in, including up until now, was the, the liberation of women. And, and the burqa oh, became a, yes. a, a much used symbol of, of Muslim intolerance and backwardness. So I'd like to ask you all, not so much about the war in Afghanistan, but that uh, Haroon makes a point where he thinks it's in many ways Muslim women who have who have borne the biggest burden of Correct. the Western media's um, sometimes uh, uh, not perfect coverage, however you want to call it. So, Bad can any of you address uh, uh, address that issue of how we in Canada? Um, are addressing, and Tony, your experience internationally as well, uh, addressing the issue of Muslim women. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with what I think was implicit or explicit in Haroun's essay that there has been um, genuine hypocrisy in the embrace in the West, including in Canada, of uh, the, the, the women's issue, so-called, as it's reflected in, particularly in Afghanistan, not that we are not appalled by certain aspects of life in Afghanistan or, dare I mention, 80 other countries. But often I used to get into these discussions when I was in Qatar with Al Jazeera, uh, you know, and I, my kind of instinct is always to say, you know, if, if one, including governments, if one is really concerned about the, the uh, liberation of women or opposed to the oppression of women, then let's look at the 45 or 50 countries where there is there are awful things being done to women. And these are countries that are funded and backed and supported by the United States, by Britain, including by Canada. So, I mean, let's get universal in our in our concern, because then otherwise it does appear to be kind of cherry picking. I think, it, again, it was more pronounced in the U.S. than in 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 Canada, but you know this issue was kind of cherry picked out of Afghanistan. You know that that in the absence of any other reason to invade Afghanistan, at least let's do it for the women. And uh, you know, I so I'm conflicted on that because as somebody like I think the entire panel here, who's traveled to numerous countries and been exposed to numerous injustices against a lot of people and certainly women. I just get a bit uncomfortable. I've gotten a bit uncomfortable about seizing on this one thing as a as a as a political justification for essentially a military action. You see, we should not forget. We should not forget that wars are fought not only on the ground there, but wars are fought at home as well. Um, because you need propaganda to conduct the yeah. wars there. You need propaganda at home to keep the public in line with what you are doing. Uh, so the reason for the Afghan women issue was brought up by uh, Laura Bush and Cherry Blair as some sort of softening of this mission. We are there to liberate Afghan women. Afghan women need liberating all right, but we did not invade Afghanistan to liberate Afghan women, period. Uh, as simple as that, that's one. Uh, number two is this idea uh, that, um, uh, the, especially the Western media, and we talked about liberal media. Uh, we are all for the liberation of uh, uh, Muslim women, and Muslim women need liberating. Correct, as Tony says, others need liberating too. But uh, this is the most ironic thing and paradoxical thing. In the last twenty years, um, the media, especially the liberal media, have been waving the flag of liberation of Muslim women. Yet it is the same media, including the liberal media, who have been most unfair to Muslim women in the West living here. 
uh, hijabi women, niqabi women, and so on. So uh, the women, uh, Muslim women who want to wear the hijab have no agency. They cannot decide for themselves. They can't think for themselves. Uh, it must be their fathers. It must be their brothers. It must be the wretched husbands who are forcing them to do it. I have news for you. Most of the women in, who are wearing the hijab in the West these days, their mothers and their family members never wore it. It is they're, they're wearing it as a symbol of identity and pride. As a reaction to all the Islamophobia, ironically, that has been going around everywhere. It's like old Catholic priests and other people telling women, you cannot have abortion. You can't think for yourself. Let's guide you to the right path here, you know? Uh, and then we have the absurdity, uh, supported by a lot of the media in Quebec and elsewhere. Uh, uh, the Ayatollahs told women to wear the hijab. The Taliban tell women to wear the hijab. We secularists will tell you not to wear the hijab. The fascist tendency is about the same. And more, even worse than that is that we will now fire you from your jobs in Quebec if you wear the hijab thereby robbing you of the very independence that you need from your husband and cruel father and cruel husband. How absurd can we get? There's a kind of stupid circularity going on and the liberal media are very much part of this thing, you know? So the women thing is just a cudgel. Nobody has to say anything. Now. No, I know you're on, you're on mute there, Julian, but nobody yeah. wants to follow it. Room that's as right. Well. That's right. Yeah. Come on, no, speak up, guys. Ironic uh, and sad. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't know much to add except that, you know, what, what Haroon said that, you know, every war is as much about, you know, the war on the ground as it is the war on words. And these ideas of these very, you see this all the time, these incredibly simplified narratives about why we're going to war, what we're doing there. And it's just, it, it's just inevitable that that's what happens. That's what the, the politicians package. And unfortunately, you know, and if all wars are complicated and often, um, you know, this is not an excuse, but often you just don't have the time or the space or you're not given that to, to report um, appropriately. So they, the media tends to seize on these really simple narratives. And they are, and as Harun said, they're, they're, they're damaging, you know, they're not, they, they get support in a way that's, um, you know, not genuine for what our intentions are. You see, there was one mm. uh, slogan during the early days of the American invasion of Afghanistan. There was a great slogan put up by, I think it was an NGO, bring your democracy, not your bikinis here. Mm. <laughs> uh, I mean, that summed up this thing, don't wage cultural warfare on us. Don't try to make us into you. Uh, let us do our own thinking, let us do our own progress. So this kind of cultural imperialism that follows and has followed 9-11 is, 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 is very much part of this discussion. And the historical prejudices, including of the liberal media, I tell you why, they, what was this all about? The Islamic bomb. We heard all about the Islamic bomb. There was nothing about Christian bomb a Jewish bomb or an atheist bomb or a Buddhist bomb or a Hindu bomb. So these are historical prejudices that date back to the Crusades and unfortunately they still linger in various parts in Orientalist fashion or in this issue of liberation of women and so on. I'm sorry I've spoken too much. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think, um, you know, Omar can add to this too because we both covered what happened in Utoya, which was in 2011 mm -hmm. when Andre uh, Brevik went into and slaughtered all those children. And um, I remember getting on a plane from, from Toronto uh, before we actually knew exactly what it was. And mm -hmm. the suspicion at the time was, of course, Al-Qaeda. And being, I think I arrived in, in London and my Blackberry, it was Blackberry back then, um, you know, <laughs> lit up and we realized the whole extent of what it was. And um, I don't know if Omar, you read the, the his manifesto, but it, it was, it, I'm sure you did. Yeah, it was striking in how the language was almost entirely like every Al-Qaeda manifesto I'd read before. And yet, I think in our coverage, I mean, I was lucky I'd been covering national security. So it was very easy to call this a terrorist offense right off the bat and use the proper language. Um, but a lot of the coverage wasn't that, you know, it wasn't necessarily called it. The, the coverage was just as we've seen in other, you know, white supremacist crimes, terrorist events, the language is always really different. Um, and that is slowly changing, but 
but very slowly. And, and, and that just goes back to my, yeah. it, it just goes back to my previous comment about why it's important to have more diversity in newsrooms. It's precisely to be able to cha challenge those um, Orientalist narratives, right? Someone at some point decided that liberation of women equals, you know, not wearing the hijab or not wearing the burqa, right? But that's a very, you know, it, it's a very um, specific group of people who have decided that. And Harun, to your point, I think that, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I grew up in a family where my mother was not veiled, my sister is not veiled, my, my fiance is not veiled. Um, but, you know, there are instances where women willingly make this choice and not because, you know, they, 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 they wear it because they want to wear it, you know, and so we have to be able to allow for that. And I think if you do have more uh, voices in, in a newsroom uh, to be able to, to articulate that and, and, and make that clear, then I think that these narratives don't, um, you know, sort of catch a light, uh, <clears throat> essentially. That yeah, leads us, I, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, uh, Arun. Yeah, just, just, just to add to what Omar said, um, my sister's never wore a hijab. Um, my wife does not wear a hijab, but I want to stand up for the right of those who do. And that is not an Islamic thing. That is a very Canadian thing. That is under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. People have the right and women should have the right to do what they wish to do with their bodies and what they wish to wear. So what are we doing being un-Canadian in trying to order them around and painting them as though they don't belong here? They very much belong in Canada, and it is Canada that gives them the right to their agency and the ability to decide for themselves what they should wear. And men should buzz off telling women, <laughs> including Muslim women, what they should or should not wear. That's a good place to, to head to, to our final kind of section. We have about eight minutes before uh, we go to questions. And let me remind the audience. Um, uh, we've got um, uh, quite a few questions, but please, if you have any questions, uh, either to any of the specific panelists or the panelists um, in general, something about what they said or something um, you, you'd like to raise. Um, but let's end with uh, looking forward and some um, uh, prescriptive uh, looks. Haroon um, concludes his article by saying that although we as journalists are in the business of critiquing everyone, we're not very gracious when we're critiqued. <laughs> and and if, you know, if we're indeed central to democracy, we do need a reckoning. So let me ask you all, and maybe we'll end with the room, but I'd like to ask uh, the three of you, what do you, are you optimistic or pessimistic going forward or we're continue to be in tumultuous times? And what do you see if you're either optimistic or pessimistic, what are you grabbing onto? What are you seeing? that is giving you hope um, uh, or not giving you hope. Uh, any one of you could start. Yeah, can I, I, I have a comment on that. Um, I mean, I, overall, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, in, for the reason that I think, um, I think society, in, let's talk Canada here, uh, because the US is, is an insane asylum on so many levels that it's <laughs> kind of in a place by itself. But in Canada, as long as we can somehow seal the border from the excesses of the South. I think there are so many differences today than there were, for example, at 9-11, you know, 22 years ago. I mean, the, 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 you know, it, it, Muslims are the, are the, the fastest growing religious group in Canada. I think that many Canadians have uh, Muslims as neighbors now, as hockey coaches, soccer coaches. I mean, it's a, it's a reality that that was arguably not really there 22 years ago. I think uh, the media for all of our flaws, and we can talk till midnight about them, reflects the diversity of this country far more today than in the past, you know? So I think that, I think the, the is, as long as news organizations listen to their audience, as opposed to Washington, for example, that, that their audience, Canadians generally are saying, let's get with the program here. This is a diverse, I mean, just let's look back at the number of Syrian brackets, Muslim refugees, Canada invited without much question, um, you know, in recent years. So I think in that sense, as long as news organizations don't kind of do what Fox does, is doing, you know, which is play to the, the political elites that they feel beholden to, you know, that I think that Canadians won't allow the news media to fall into 
uh, kind of racist tropes that we've been worried about, you know? So in that sense, I think that as long as audiences um, have access to Canadian news organizations, that um, their things have changed and we can be very easy in, in neglecting and not acknowledging that things have really changed dramatically. And I think they'll probably change for the better. Michelle? Um, well, I think I'm optimistic just because I'm generally optimistic by nature, but um, I was at a, a, a great conference this weekend at the Global Reporting Center in, in Vancouver, where it brought together international reporters with local journalists. And it was called, the conference was called Fixing the Fixer Relationship. And a fixer, for those who don't know, is, is often a local journalist that we will work with when we're abroad. And sort of the first first order of business is to get rid of that word because it's quite derogatory. And um, that's what we're hearing loud and clear. But what the great takeaway with this really distinguished group of local journalists was that, um, you know, that relationship is getting better. And that idea of this sort of uh, old colonial white guy as the foreign correspondent going into these mm -hmm. countries and, you know, writing this very stereotypical, often racist pieces is, is on its way out because we're empowering local journalists so much more to tell their own stories. I think the breed of journalists who are traveling abroad are tend to be um, less ignorant, tend to be tend to, to, to be better journalists. So in that sense, I think there's some really positive things that are happening. And I think, you know, domestically too, journalists who are coming out of journalism school now come out with a lot more skills. It's it's harder to get into the, the business in some ways. And they, um, in addition to being a much more diverse school, there's just some, some great talent that's coming out. Mm. Where I remain a little bit pessimistic is just the business in general. I mean, this, this incredible distrust of the media um, is, is really a problem. And of course, declining, you know, revenue is part of the reason why I, you know, went independent and, and left the star in 2018 was because we no longer did foreign news and we're not doing it anymore because we can't afford it. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, the business is, I think, especially in print is, is, um, troublesome, but in terms of the quality of reporting and, you know, being more fair and nuanced, I'm optimistic. Omar, you're sitting in the anchor chair in Canada's most watched television newscast. We're heading into, <laughs> if we thought the last few months were, were hectic, things are going to get even crazier, American elections, more wars. Um, um, wh what, are, what keeps you going um, when you wake up in the morning and, and you see uh, the, uh, the news that you have to cover? I think, you know, the world needs more gray I, in terms of nuance and, and, and understanding, and that's what keeps me going. I, th I think Michelle's answer was, was also a very nuanced one. Uh, I am optimistic precisely because I think we are seeing uh, more representations in newsrooms. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing, you know, it goes without saying, increased polarization. Social media hasn't necessarily helped that. We're also seeing um, some politicians seize on uh, issues of, of religion and identity politics. So you've got you've got sort of um, these these two segments of, of society that you know have the potential and have at times you know clashed uh, to a huge detriment. But I really think it's it's incumbent on, on all of us to you know really um, you know challenge prevailing narratives, make sure that there is nuance. And this also goes for Muslims too. You know, I was I was in the pod um, in our newsroom sometime last year, and there was a non-Muslim journalist who had seen a, 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 some video that had come in from one of our partner agencies and, and um, asked me, Omar, what does this mean? Now, I, for, I had no idea. <laughs> I, I had, I wasn't familiar with that. And there could have been two ways of there could have been two ways of approaching that, right? One, I could have said, "What are you asking me?" Because I'm the, you know, only Muslim in the pot, and I should know everything about, you know, or accept it, in, you know, with a spirit of humility and openness, and, and say, you know, I don't know, but let's figure this out together, you know. Mm -hmm. And I chose the latter, and mm -hmm. I think that um, it's it's important for for people, for journalists, for Muslims, for non-Muslims, all of them, to realize their. Um, to realize what their blind spots are. And as Haroon mentioned in his essay, make sure you, you know, don't get your back up. But what is true of these journalistic conversations is also true of life, I think. You have to approach people who don't agree with you or, or have questions with a sense of openness, of humility, and in the spirit of, of building bridges, which I think is, you know, critical even more so today, given the polarization that we are seeing. Um, 
Haroon, we, we started with you. Um, before we go to questions, we have we have uh, about a dozen questions to try to go through. Um, let's end with you in a minute or two. Um, um, you know, if, is there anything you would have changed in your essay now that you listen to this uh, hour long conversation? No, I think um, what I did not emphasize enough in that essay, I think this is not a Muslim issue. This is mm. a Canadian issue. Mm. It's a Muslim issue in the Muslim world. Uh, America's dealing with the Middle East and so on and so forth. In Canada, it's a Canadian issue because the Muslim is a barometer of the status of our democracy. Our stated uh, grand declarations of equality of all people, dignity of all groups, all those wonderful phrases that we talk about. Uh, we see ourselves as the great... Uh, uh, savior of democracy. Democracy dies in darkness. We bring light. We don't bring light all the time. We, in fact, add to the darkness, and we did. Um, of course, things have improved. Islamophobia is not an overt business model like in Canada as it is in Fox News and remains so to a great extent. Diversity on payroll is improving, but far more important is the portrayal, regardless of whether it is um, people of uh, color who are in the newsroom or Muslim, non-Muslim, that is as good as it is. Ultimately, what counts is the kind of portrayal we produce. Do we give all Canadians equal dignity in the way we cover things, to live up to the ideals that we believe uh, that we have? Um, in the portrayal also, I see an improvement um, uh, in a very important area that we did not talk about. The media have been obsessed with Muslims. They talk about Muslims all the time, but they never talk to Muslims. Hmm. The only Muslims they talk to are pliant Muslims who can confirm those prejudices, who say, yes, sir, you are right. Muslims are very bad people. Heal thyself, Muslims. Everything will be fine. Uh, there's a, there is less reliance on them. And there's more reliance on people who can speak for themselves. During the hijab debate, niqab debate, during the sharia debate, the only people media were quoting um, were none of these people who were affected. They were quoting people, secularists, uh, who don't like the hijab. See, look at this Muslim here in Montreal. She also objects to it. We're looking for confirmation for our prejudices. That is now happening less and less. So there is hope. I'm a perennially optimistic Canadian, I think, uh, like Michelle. Uh, and we are infinitely better than we were 20 years ago. That goes without saying. But we have our work cut out for us. All right. On that uh, optimistic but challenging note, let's go to some questions. Um, and will uh, read us uh, one question at a time. Uh, go ahead, Ange. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first question, uh, why is mainstream media coverage of Palestine and Palestinians so abysmal? And what will it take for Canadian media to address their harmful coverage of our community and cover Palestinian stories in an accurate and humane manner, similar to other groups resisting occupation of their lands? Uh, as an example, Ukrainians. Will newsrooms address anti-Palestinian racism? Is the fact that Pal most Palestinians are Muslim colored, uh, are Muslims colored the reporting of their oppression in the West? Tony, anybody want to tackle that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I agree, sadly, that I think the portrayal of the Palestinian side in Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been um, bordering on abysmal in Canada over um, a, a long period of time. I mean, I think, again, as I said at the top in reference to Arun's essay, I think there are many exceptions. And I, I again, without overstating, CBC's contribution. I think there were times when the CBC made a real effort to uh, basically look at the Israeli conflict as a conflict between two equal parts and, and treat each side with the kind of depth and the kind of respect I think that the questioner is, is asking. Um, it's interesting that, you know, I'm, I'm many several years away from being with the CBC and obviously influence to a great extent by my Al Jazeera experience, um, I think part of the problem in, in Canada is that um, 
the pressure on news organizations has effectively come from one side, from an incredibly skillful pro-Israeli lobby that um, knows how to play the game, does it, in my experience, with a, 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 an appalling level of dishonesty, but they know how to turn the screws on many news organizations. And over time, that's had an impact, I think. And I think that, uh, if anything, uh, I, you know, my um, wish from afar would be that the pro-Palestinian uh, forces in Canada uh, play the game a bit like that and realize that the news media in Canada, as well as elsewhere, respond to pressure and accountability. And I, I think the appalling coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict overall, I think, in Canada has, to a certain extent, been a response to the failure of these news organizations being held accountable. So somebody needs to do that. And uh, it must be those who have an understanding and a sympathy for the Palestinian cause. Yeah, you see, because the, um, uh, the coverage is so unbalanced, imbalanced, that it is shameful. And in fact, just as I did that essay, I wish somebody would do an essay analyzing the Canadian media's coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. No question, uh, there are people who are anti-Semites who, who wish unwell on Israel, but criticism of Israel does not equal to anti-Semitism, period. Um, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who equate supporting Israel with hating Muslims. That was one of the things that came out of the post 9-11 era. Um, that, uh, and there is also extremists on both sides, uh, on the Jewish side and the Muslim side, who have turned what is a, what is a territorial dispute, what, is a, uh, what is, has been named as a colonial dispute, in effect, into a yeah. Muslim-Jewish issue, which it is not because some of, the, well, some of the people most affected in Palestine are Christians. Uh, some of the biggest stalwarts of the Palestinian liberation movement were Christian Palestinians. So this is wrong to have turned it into a Jewish uh, Muslim issue uh, added on to by the fundamentalist Christians in, in America for their own wrong reasons. Uh, it is a totally uh, unbalanced coverage, and all you have to do is look at the self-censorship that goes on every day in the newspapers. Uh, one Palestinian dead, uh, nothing. 100 Palestinians dead, little story. Five Israelis dead, big story. I mean, this happens day in and day out. This is shameful. Uh, and this is, this is, in the end, in the long run, what really happens is that the so-called friends of Israel here are not doing Israel any favor uh, in the end by doing uh, the kind of almost blind support that they are giving to right-wing Leputnik kind of policies. I don't mean to get political here, but fairness, balance, as Tony speaks about, is totally lacking. And um, next uh, question? Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, uh, somebody asked, do you feel coverage of Rohingya and or Uyghurs or Muslims in India would be different, more substantial if they weren't Muslim? The war on Ukraine seems like obvious leading news, but comparing just how leading and sustained it's been for a year now uh, with dedicated print graphics, I can't imagine it being the case where the victim's Muslim. Yeah, you see, the, the Ukrainian issue brings out... Um... Another thing that's just bubbling under the surface, um, which has clearly shown the kind of, one hesitates to use the word racist attitude that has been brought into the open. Um, it's a white nation. We have Ukrainian Canadians who are obviously identify with this. Uh, uh, Putin is uh, an evil person. This is an unjust war. Uh, great injustices have been done on, 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 on Ukrainian people. Uh, war, uh, war crimes have been committed, but war crimes have been committed elsewhere as well. So there's a kind of selectivity in this issue that has shown up and that is lacking, as in the case of the questioner of the Rohingya people and the other people and so on. Um, remember Mr. Harper, sitting prime minister, was demonizing these potential Syrian refugees to come. Oh, these are terrorists who will come and do all sorts of things and so on. Uh, it took a new government to change that. And again, back to the Canadian people, they welcomed 50,000, more than 50,000 Syrians and, 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 and incorporated them into Canada. 
just the same way we had people from Hungary and uh, the the Jewish pogroms in Ukraine long time ago, uh, the uh, Vietnamese boat people and so on and so forth. So the Canadian public um, is one, and what really the what really happens uh, by politicians and so on is a different thing. Sorry, back to back to uh, Ukrainian. Uh, you also talk about the uh, you you know you talk about the media. Remember the two Michaels in in China? They were held. Uh, the media had exemplary coverage, exemplary watch on their fate um, and how they were uh, picked up by the Chinese unfairly held for a thousand days and so on. But there's another Canadian who is held up there in in China and nobody talks about him one bit. Um, the only difference is he's not white and he's Muslim. This is not good. This does not speak well of the Canadian media. This does not speak well of Canada. Tony, jump and in. we welcome yeah. Ukrainian yeah. here as well. Yeah, can I? Yeah, if I can just make a quote. But we don't welcome others. It does not speak well of Canada. So I can just make a quick, you know, a quick comment about I'm not any longer in a Canadian newsroom. So I, the, the choices between this story and that story are, are troublesome, but I can't speak to the specific question. But just to go back to uh, Michelle's point about the the um, the undoing, I guess, of foreign coverage by the Toronto Star and and matched us colossally uh, by the cutbacks at the CBC in terms of, of international coverage. I think one of the great ironies and one of the tragic ironies of our time here in Canada is that at a time when we have an incredibly diverse population that sees above all the essential need for Canada and Canadians to be uh, intertwined closely in the world. And a, a younger population that travels much more than any other population. We have the major news organizations in Canada, all of them, you know, the CBC. I, I can't speak for the CTV, but I suspect the CTV as well. The Star, the Globe, a Canadian press, gradually just shutting the window to the world, you know? So, you know, the, I guess my answer to the question would be all of these stories should have been covered. They should have been given coverage because audiences here in Canada are, want that. But what we've done, the Canadian news organizations, is we follow the American model, you know, which is let's do it cheaply. You know, let's let's get commentators. Let's cut cut the reporters in the field off. And that, and that uh, given, again, the diversity of our country is one of these perplexing <laughs> stupidities that I think we're all going to carry the can for. Hey, if no one else um, wants to pick up on that, um, Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, so the next question is from Osama. Uh, in what ways is media coverage of ISIS different from coverage of 9-11? Hmm. Michelle? Yeah, I mean, in some ways it was, you know, apples and oranges in terms of what the stories were themselves. I mean, ISIS was a an occupying force that, um, you know, and it became uh, turned into a war. Um, if you're talking about 9-11, the specific, you know, incident itself. But one interesting thing with, with, with ISIS is that as a group, they actually bypassed us. Um, so, you know, over the years, it was interesting when I would cover um, Al Qaeda or some of its affiliates. I think over the years, I talked to three, maybe four people who are on the UN terrorism watch list. And those are always difficult, difficult stories to do because you don't want to give people a platform. When it came to ISIS, um, they were they were their own media machine. Um, so it was funny. We so there is actually strangely very little access for um uh, mainstream journalists. They were just reporting on their reports and propaganda. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of was there, you know, what we're talking about here on this panel, uh, the, the demonization of, of, of Muslim communities, I think that still happened. Absolutely. I mean, I think we saw it was, you know, from 9-11 till the Arab Spring, there was this tremendous growth. And then I think the Arab Spring was this incredible turning point. Um, and I know, and I know when I wrote Decade of Fear, that's when I ended it. 
and I sort of didn't see the the start of ISIS coming and had very different conclusions that I'd be embarrassed to look back on now. But, um, you know, and then ISIS, I think, came and did push us back quite a bit. I think it was a little bit better than after 9-11. There was some nuance. There was some, I mean, there were there were journalists who had been immersed in this at least for 10 years and, and knew some of the pitfalls. There wasn't quite the same ignorance, but I do think the pendulum swung again and there was quite an anti-Muslim bias again that we're only coming out of now. You see, the 19 terrorists of 9-11 were Muslims. Uh, the terrorists of ISIS are also Muslims. But that doesn't make all Muslims terrorists. That's the argument. Number two is, uh, it's lest it be forgotten uh, that the rise of ISIS and the birth of ISIS came as a byproduct of the American invasion of Iraq. Yeah, and I think I mean I do think to be fair, I think those stories did eventually come out. Again, that, and that's what I mean by there had been you know reporters who had been immersed in this beat and knew that it was you know at the prison because of the leaders who had been you know taken down from from Iraq that ISIS um, you know rose. And I think there was some some reporting that you know noted the fact that ISIS had their prisoners in the orange jumpsuits of Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib. There there was that reporting that was being done that you know gave the story the geopolitical context that it needed and deserve it deserved much beyond you know the the racist tropes that we'd seen before but having said that um it was very you know just when you think you get this far it was very quick to go back um yeah to to some of the the racism we saw off the bat I think also yeah. what was interesting about ISIS too is that it forced many western societies to look inward because um you know some of these fighters were, 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 they were born in Western societies, they were converting, uh, they were going abroad to take part in what they felt was, you know, a, a cause. Um, and so th that was an interesting dimension to the discussion. What was it about these societies that, you know, made people feel so marginalized from where they were growing up? So that was an interesting part of the, uh, the, the, the reporting and, and the coverage at that time. But mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, back to what you were saying, I mean, I was, you know, as we were seeing the ISIS videos, I was astounded by the level of propaganda and how sophisticated that machine was. There was music, there were flags, there were, I mean, it looked like um, the, the video productions were, were incredibly sophisticated and also very scary, but they had created an ecosystem where they were really able to speak to, um, you know, their, their audience. What amusing and ironic and sad and tragic thing out of that is the following. Whereas post 9-11, much of the media were constantly saying, uh, we're seeing terrorists under every minaret in, in, in Canada, and the mosques and imams were breeding uh, jihadists and terrorists. These uh, stupid kids who went, um, they got radicalized on the internet, which is a Western invent invention. It has nothing to do with Islam or, or mosques. And as, as Omar says, they were so sophisticated, it turns out from the technology that they learned here and they were employing it there in, in Iraq, you know. Yeah, there's some, there some great it's studies. It sort of exposes another, another level of hypocrisy on our part, you see. Yeah. There's some great studies done on the propaganda videos where they were in the States, I can't remember what university, but they were comparing them side by side by military recruiting. Western uh -huh. military recruiting videos and Call of Duty, and actually like scene by scene that ISIS had, you know, no, no. used the same the same propaganda. Yeah, yeah. but just just to, to your to the last point we had when we were um, when Julian you were asking questions was you know are you optimistic and where are we at now? That issue of the uh, Canadians who had joined ISIS and are languishing in these camps, the majority of whom are um, children uh, and women, and that's a very live issue right now because Canadian government is preparing to bring them back to yeah. to Canada and as we know there's been incredible you know opposition to that um and and not there's been some intelligence re reporting done on it nuanced reporting but you still get some of the same knee jerk stuff that you would have seen after 911 we have just a little under 10 minutes we may not have time to get to all the questions so Ange, pick some of the best next <laughs> one up Okay, the next question is from Corey. Uh, Corey asks, uh, how in 2023 do you responsibly cover the anti-immigrant Islamophobic positions of far-right populist, populist politicians without legitimizing or popularizing their point of view? <laughs> Good point, because it's news. If, if somebody who's got a position of power- or it's like the Donald, Donald Trump syndrome, you know, how do you cover him and not cover him at the same time? 
when he was president. Um, I think the American media, by and large, certainly the New York Times and the Washington Post um, were pioneers in this. Um, they took to calling, um, calling him out as a liar within the stories when he was saying those things, which was a new kind of journalism that had not been done before. Um, uh, should we be doing it at this point uh, uh, in the case of anti-immigrant sentiments and the conspiracy theories um, uh, and the disbelief in science and scientists and so on? Um, I'm not an expert on that subject, but I think we should. Perhaps uh, Tony or Michelle yeah. or would have more to yeah, say. I, mean, I, I, think the I think the challenge of all news organizations is to choose what they deem news and what they not they deem something that they won't report. So I I, I don't I think that uh, the American media's handling of this issue dating back to early Trump 2016 has been pretty abysmal. I mean, in the sense that they've they've given excessive exposure to the arguments. And I agree with Haroon that kind of late in the day, in the bottom of the ninth inning, they started using the word liar. But they they still then uh, you know, gave paragraphs and paragraphs of 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 space to to the the BS that has been voiced, and that applies to a lot of the a lot of the you know these far right lunatics that are in the House. And my worry, I remember during the um, during in 2016 during the Republican uh, debates when people still couldn't believe that Donald Trump would be nominated. Um, and they, I think on CNN, they, they ran the debates. And afterwards, instead of going to a panel of experts to comment, they actually went to a 20-minute interview with Donald Trump, one of the <laughs> 16 people on the stage. And people asked the president at the time, I think it was, I think it was Zucker, why would you, why would you do this? And, and his, his line, or it may have been the head of CBS, was, yeah, OK, this may not be good for, for the country, but it sure is hell good for CBS. In. in other words, they're making a hell of a lot of money by get, by amplifying and by by giving voice to all of this crap. And so the bottom line uh, obsession of a lot of these news organizations define the coverage of these issues. So I think if if they and we have not learned since then to basically be restrained and to be careful, then I think we're nuts. I just want to give credit to it was actually Daniel Dale at the Toronto Star who started that yes. idea of calling out and why yes, yeah. that, that drove the who's now he's now at CNN, but that drove the coverage of the New York Times and Washington Post and others to come in because he did yeah. the fact check, you know, and that's now sort of a standard um, practice when, you know, public debates is like, nope, just lied on that, lied on that. And that's that's a wonderful yeah. thing because for so long we didn't do that, you know. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it was Osama who asked the question. I have just got two words to that, and that's fact check, right? And um, yeah. I was just going to mention Daniel Dale's name because he he did such a marvelous job with that. Yes, Certainly during elections, we've seen um, the CP come out with its baloney meter to fact check uh, yeah. uh, politicians. <laughs> and I think even outside of elections and outside of a Donald Trump administration, I mean, we all we all fact check on a day to day level. Uh, but there, there is something about a, you know being transparent about that process and putting it out there that I think um, is is really important and, and challenges some of uh, what's what's going on right now. Baloney meter for the next federal election in Canada. I'm sorry. <laughs> you need. He the said we need a baloney meter That's for the right. next election. Or, or, we, or we have to repatriate Daniel Dale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, Nick, Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Hafsa. Uh, working with Muslim sources as a journalist and having spoken with other journalists who have done the same, there seems to be a continued distrust of media in the Muslim community. <laughs> this manifests in not just being wary of speaking to journalists, but also being wary of consuming mainstream news media and engaging with it. How as an industry and as journalists, can we go about rebuilding that trust after having fractured it since 9-11? Yeah, That's a I good mean, question because we really haven't addressed, you know, we've been talking about coverage, but now we're talking about uh, speaking and, and getting Muslim Canadians uh, to speak and talk to us. Michelle? Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of the distrust in, of media writ large, really. Um, but I know I always sort of joke that I, I feel like the longer I stay in journalism, the worse journalist I become because I 
tend to talk people out of talking to me. I mean, I just think it's really our responsibility and our duty of care of everybody we talk to that you're completely honest with what you're doing. And just as an industry, just to get that credibility, um, it's going to take, you know, all journalists doing that saying like, this is, this is what the story I'm doing is about. This is why, this is what can happen to you when you go, your name is online. Are you prepared for that? Um, and then also just having credibility when, when we get it wrong, you call it out. There's never been a more important time for when we do mistakes. And of course we do mistakes. Um, that doesn't qu quite get to your issue of trust, but I think it's just, it's, it's just, it's just about building our own credibility and being completely upfront with what, and honest with what you're doing. Omar, let me ask you, cause one of I, the first question to you was you were a young consumer of the news. Now you're one of the most important people broadcasting the news. Um, how how would you want to see the Canadian media build trust um, with the uh, Muslim community? Well, I think you know. First of all, it's it's making sure you're inclusive of of all voices, of all perspectives. Uh, transparency is a huge deal, which Michelle uh, just touched on, um, and it's really it, it is a reestablishment of of credibility, which. By the way, it's not going to happen overnight, right? It, these are things that take time. It has to be uh, a consistent pattern of behavior. Um, but you know, there there has to be, you know, all all media needs to become more humble. And what I mean by that is what Michelle already touched on. If if there is um, an opportunity where we could, you know, do better or you know have another perspective, or if we have made an error. To, to make sure that we, you know, call that out. At CTV, we, we belong to something called the Trust Project. So if there is um, an amendment to a piece or a change or a cor correction, we're transparent about that. A lot of other news organizations um, do the same thing. Uh, but but it will absolutely make take time. And I hope that, um, you know, Muslims and, and, and all Canadians, everybody, uh, realize that certainly the intent is there. Um, I would say that most outlets uh, are, are committed to that and uh, everybody's trying to do better. Well, on, on that note, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, thank obviously our panelists and, and the questioners. And let me hand it back to uh, uh, Jim Turk for the uh, Center for Free Expression. Well, thank you, Julian. And a huge thanks to the panel. You know, we do a lot of events like this. I can't remember one that was more riveting and more engaging. So we're really grateful to uh, the four of you and to Julian for moderating it. So thank you. And thank you to the audience for joining us today for your fine questions. We're sorry that we weren't able to get to all the questions that you have. Uh, I just want to share with you that a video of today's panel will be posted on the Center for Free Expression website tomorrow. Uh, that website address is cfe, cfe dot torontomu.ca, so cfe.torontomu.ca. Along with the video, we're gonna post additional, a, a list of resources, readings, uh, YouTube videos, whatever, for those of you who'd like to delve into the questions that uh, uh, were discussed today on, on today's panel. Uh, there were references to some materials that you might wanna read, those will be posted. Uh, so that will be a resource and I hope you'll share uh, the link to the video with others who weren't able to watch it today who you think might be interested. So thank you again very much. Also on our website are videos of our past events. Some have addressed questions uh, uh, related to these. So please feel free to check the website for past events, as well as a list of our upcoming events. So again, thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.